I'm constantly working on some project or another, and uh, I've been working on a new lead-in for our pre-service videos, you know? You know the videos that I generally play. I am the Whoops. Lord. As y'all are coming into church on Sunday, and uh, this is just the lead-in. In other words, I this is not the whole video. Right. This is just the part that's going to be at the very front of I am the, Lord, the video. I am the Almighty God. I am the one for whom nothing is too hard. I am the shepherd. I am the I am the good news to the bound and the poor. I am. For visitors who may be sitting and watching, we want to send a message and help them to understand uh, they're welcome, they're affirmed, that they're free to worship. There are no ties about their hands. Amen. There we go. We're going to get started this evening. Uh, Brother Jack will not be with us this evening. He is at home, and he'll be watching by reason of the Internet, or at least he hopes he is. And uh, so, Jack, if you're out there, hello. Uh, but we want to get started this evening, and let's just immediately go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you so much, and we are so grateful, God, for the relationship that we have with you. We're grateful, God, for revelation and understanding and knowledge that is imparted unto us by the Holy Ghost. We thank you, God, for our church. We thank you, Lord for this facility. We thank you, God, for helping us to accomplish and achieve as much as we have been able to accomplish in the last nearly 16 years. Lord, there are great needs that exist at this time, and the Word of God declares, Lord, that you know what we have need of before we even ask it. But I lift up today, God, before you those needs, and I ask God, that you would meet every need according to the promise of your word, according to the riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we might ask or think. God, we know today that you're able. And right now we need you, God, to step in and to do what needs to be done. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this service we ask that you would anoint every portion and every part, that every spoken word glorify you, that every song that is sung lift up the name of Jesus. We ask it all in none other than that precious name, even Jesus. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. First things first, I remembered this time, <laughs> and I have... A baptismal certificate for Sister Lisa. So, Sister Lisa, this certificate is suitable for framing. If you would like to frame it, you may do so. There you go, darling. God bless you. I We baptized Sister Beverly back in May, and I completely forgot to print up the certificate. Well, when I baptized you, I thought, okay, I need to make her a certificate. And when I said that, I said, oh. Beverly, I forgot Beverly's. So I have Beverly's here as well, and we'll be able to give that to her Sunday, God willing. And uh, that is something I, we like to do, make sure you have a record of your baptism. Generally speaking, if you were to go to another uh, apostolic church, generally 
they accept that as acknowledgement that you've been baptized in the name of the Lord, as that is a requirement for membership in most apostolic churches. So just so you know, not that you're planning on leaving or we're planning no. on shipping you off or anything. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that is, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of church membership requirements, at least in our church. And uh, the only thing we do require is that uh, people be baptized in the name of the Lord. And the reason for that is simple because that is how in Scripture you're baptized into the body. So in other words, we're not... We're not doing that as some, you know, uh, requirement we just kind of picked off the top of our head. You know, some arbitrary requirement. But that is how scripture counts people being baptized into the faith. And so that is how we measure membership. And uh, as, if someone comes to our church and they've already been baptized in Jesus' name, then we easily are able to take them in as a member. Uh, if someone comes in and they have not yet been, when they decide to do so, then you officially become a member of the church. Until that time, don't think for one minute that your input and your uh, you know, uh, involvement is less, because it is not. But it's just an official thing, okay? Amen. Amen. Want to get started this evening? Boy, I got to tell you, I had, and some people might say, Pastor, why do you go into this? This doesn't have anything to do with God or the church. Yes, it does, and yes, it does. I went to have lunch today at, uh, yeah, that place. <laughs> the burger joint on Town East we like to go to. Burger Street. Burger Street. Burger Street. Went to Burger Street to get me a chicken sandwich. They have got, I'm going to do an advertisement for them. They have got one of the best chicken sandwiches you will ever eat. Absolutely delicious. I love their chicken sandwiches. And they have uh, uh, sweet potato fries versus regular white fries, you know, and I love their sweet potato fries. Well, I went there to have a bite to eat this afternoon, and while I'm sitting there, there is a black woman sitting at a table kind of across the aisle from me. And after a few minutes, uh, I began to kind of strike up a conversation with her. And I told her, you know, I said, uh, this Trump debacle really has me stressed out. I said, I really am deeply troubled by what's going on right now in our country and all this. Well, obviously, being a person of color, she shared my opinion, and we began to have a wonderful talk, a really nice talk. And then, uh, apparently, she was waiting on her brother and sister-in-law to show up, and they showed up, and then the three of us were having a conversation. And uh, by the end of the conversation, I was running a little bit late today on account of that conversation. By the end of that conversation, I went over and uh, introduced myself and shook hands and everything. And uh, before I left, I said to them, I said, I want you to know, I love you. You are my neighbor. And because you're my neighbor, I love you. And uh, they were just all grins and smiles. And we had such a positive exchange of energy and such a positive exchange. Uh, folks, this lady was saying to me, she said, I have never seen so much anger. She said, even in my community, in my neighborhood, she said, people that otherwise would not act like this. She said, all of a sudden, it's like everybody is on edge. Yes. Everybody is angry. Yes. She said, I'm seeing fights break out between people, and I'm seeing, you know, anger expressed by people. She said, and this is not who they are. This is not how they normally are. Correct. And as she was saying that, I thought to myself, the church, this is where this comes into play, folks. The church had better be aware that we are in a spiritual battle. This is not merely an issue of, well, you know, we chose a Republican over a Democrat. That is not what's happening right now. No. That is not what is happening. I prophesied and I said over and over and over and over again before the election, if Donald Trump were to get elected, 
which surely will end up in civil war. This man is pushing every button he can push. Oh, yes. That speech he made last night oh. in Arizona was a nightmare. This man is pushing, and he is doing these so-called campaign rallies. Yeah. These are not campaign rallies. No. No, they are not. These are Hitler-esque mm -hmm. grassroots rallies which are meant to keep him uh, in close contact, and I'm going to say it as plain as I can say it, with the most ignorant and stupid among us. Yes. Yes. So yes. that he can stir them up yes. with his lies, hypocrisies, and his bile. And this man, folks, I'm telling you, is pushing every button yes. until guns are, until we start to see gunfire. That is what he's doing. Yeah. He continues to demonize Hillary Clinton because Hitler said hate is more powerful than dislike. That's right. Well, Hillary Clinton's not part of the picture anymore. So there's no need to even preach Hillary Clinton. But there is a need if your intention is to keep the bile flowing, mm -hmm. to keep the hatred flowing, to keep the negativity flowing. He uses her as a symbol of all of, the, of us who are on the left. And now he's going after the news. You know, and then, I mean, he's demonized the press. He's been doing this since the beginning of time. You know, of course, now as a real estate uh, developer, he manipulated the press like it was going out of style right. and used it for his own self-promotion. He wouldn't even have the false lying image of himself in the minds of so many Americans today were it not for the press. So they helped him get where he is. But as we see, he has no loyalty to anyone. Doesn't matter if you're so-called on his side or not on his side. The minute you do anything he doesn't like, he turns on you like a snake. Yeah. This man is turning on members of his own party. He's turning on senators in the Republican Party. I mean, just, this is the most demonic mess I have ever witnessed in my life. And if you're out there on the Internet and you do not realize and recognize that what is happening in our country today is demonic powers have been unleashed. And the man at the head, the helm of the ship, is doing everything in his power to keep these negative, nasty, hateful spirits stirred up. He is going out of his way. And now, listen to me. We have to combat this the best we can. One way you can do that, take this preacher's advice. Tommy will tell you, I do it all the time. I see someone that I clearly know is on the low end of the Trump interest spectrum. People of color, LGBT people, Hispanic people, all of these that he loves to demonize and he loves to call enemies and what have you and those he is just playing political pranks on in order to solidify the support of the religious right because Donald Trump doesn't give a flying fig about LGBT people one way or the other but he's playing this game because it gains him the worship of idiots on the religious right but when you see people that you know are very likely experiencing a lot of negative emotion and a lot of negative feeling. Speak up. Yeah. Yes. Do not let them pass you by without your letting them know, I'm on your side. Correct. We're going to make it. Talk to people. This is an opportunity for Americans who are of a liberal stripe. This is an opportunity for us to speak up and share our heart with those, because folks, I'm going to tell you something. The black community for decades has had leaders who balk 
at, or if not growl at, the notion that LGBT rights is the same as racial rights, you know. Uh, equal rights in the LGBT community is the same as equal rights in the black community, the Hispanic community. There are many leaders in the black world who for decades have told us, no, it's not the same, it's not the same. Well, let me tell you a little secret. When we start getting shipped off to concentration camps, you're suddenly going to realize it is very much the same. That's right. Because I got news for you. I'd be willing to bet you a million dollars the Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the uh, homosexuals, and the Jews, and the gypsies in the concentration camps didn't all sit there hating on one another and looking at each other with all kinds of negativity. No, they were all in the same boat. And those of you in the black community today, if you're watching this, wake up! See what Donald Trump is doing to LGBT people. Look at how he's trying to roll back all the progress that has been made. You're next. You're next. Don't think you're not. That's right. You can either be foolish and wait until we're being shipped off to camps to realize that, yes, our fight is very much the same fight. Or you can wake up and realize now that we're in the same boat. I despise, there is no religion, and, and I hate, honestly, you, you have no idea how hard it is for me to say these things sometimes, knowing Tommy's background and everything. I, I, don't, I don't say these things with glee, believe me. I love his parents, they're good people. I pray for them all the time, all the time. But I despise the doctrine of the Jehovah's Witnesses more than I despise any doctrine of any pseudo-Christian organization on the face of planet Earth. The Mormons are almost equal, but not quite. Because if you look at the fine print of their doctrine, although it's doctrines of devils, they at least leave some fundamental truths intact. Jesus Christ did in fact literally rise from the dead. Whereas the Jehovah's Witnesses have rewritten that so that Jesus Christ did not literally rise from the dead. He emerged a spirit being. God caused his body to dissolve. Now where they got all this, I'll never know. But anyway, you know, and then he appeared in a variety of bodies, in a variety of forms to his disciples to prove he was alive. Well, I got news for you. If you appear to me as eight different people, I, that hardly is going to convince me that you're you. That, that's pretty hard for me to swallow. But you see, they have taken every fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith, and they have twisted it, and they have perverted it. I despise the doctrine of the Jehovah's Witness. I believe it is a demonic doctrine. The Word of God tells us that in the last days they would preach doctrines of devils. And I believe that group represents doctrines of devils. However, having said that, if Trump tomorrow were to try to start a war against the Jehovah's Witnesses, I would fight for them. That's right. You're absolutely right. Because as an American, if we're going to have freedom of religion, then that means all religions, period. End of the story. And if God wants to wipe that foul doctrine off the face of the planet, then let God do it. That's right. I have enough confidence in God to know that when God wants to get something done, believe me, he can do it. And, uh, you know, honestly, with as many child molestation cases have come against them over the last few decades. They are right now in such financial peril that that organization may disintegrate within the next decade all by itself anyway. You know, let God be the one. The problem with the church world today is they claim faith in God, but they do not possess faith in God. Mm -mm. 
Oh, well, gays are getting this and queers are getting that and these people are getting this and, uh, and we need to do something. No, you don't need to do a thing. You need to let God be God is what you need to do. Yeah, but nothing's happening. Well, so what are you saying? You're saying that you then in, in some divine wisdom need to act on God's behalf because God doesn't know how to get it done? That's what they're saying, Martin. Right. They don't want to admit that's what they're saying, but that's exactly what they're saying. And we need to be careful, folks, because those spirits that Donald Trump has unleashed in our America today, they will affect you. There you are. Don't think they won't. They will affect you. You will find yourself looking at a person of color and all of a sudden having more of a negative reaction and more of a negative response to maybe something that they do or say, and in the back of your brain that demon saying, ah, yeah, you think you're going to act like that in Donald Trump's America? It will affect you. It can take you over. We need to recognize we are in a spiritual battle. And that is why leaders in the church have to keep speaking up and speaking out. If we are not diligent in this matter, it is going to overtake our churches and we are going to find ourselves walking in lockstep with the enemy of our souls. And I, for one, am not willing to let that happen. And the best way to combat the works of darkness is to approach it from a proactive place. In other words, don't just sit back silently and say nothing and hope for the best and pray for the best. No, 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 no. Have conversations. Open your mouth. Talk to people. You see a person of color, look them right in the eye and say, I just want to tell you I am a white man and I despise Donald Trump. I despise his, uh, the things he stands for and the things he's trying to do. And I just want you to know that. And see if you don't put smiles on a lot of people's faces. See if it doesn't make people happy to know that they're not alone in this and that there are people outside of their race, there are people outside of their circle of friends who are willing to speak up and state unequivocally, I do not support this man. I do not support what he is doing. I do not support his agenda. I do it all the time, folks. And I'm telling you, the energy that I left that restaurant with, it was positive. I, it was not, we were not sitting there griping about Donald Trump. No, we were saying, I stand with you. That's what I was telling them. That's what I was saying. And I let them know, I love you. I understand the mantra, Black Lives Matter. And I got news for you. They matter to me. I understand that matter. I don't sit back like so many ignorant people I know on Facebook who sit, and I mean people I'm connected to on Facebook, who gripe. Well, all lives matter. Yeah, you know, all lives. Obviously, you don't have a clue what's going on in black America, and you don't have a clue how black folks are treated, and you don't have a clue why they started saying black lives matter. I told these folks today, I said, I've preached in uh, more black churches in my ministry than I have white. I had an overseer, uh, Lisa, many years ago, good man. He was a good man, and, and he, he thought what he was saying, you know, was, was good and what have you. Uh, and, I'm, and it was not by any means malicious or anything like that, but he literally told me. He said, your ministry will go much further if you don't preach in so many black churches. No, 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 no. He said, you know, you're spending all your time preaching in black churches. And for every Sunday you're in a black <laughs> church, you're not available to preach in other churches. And I told him, I said, let me tell you, when God called me to preach, he told me whatever door opened before me, that was the door I was to go through. I said, if a black church invites me to preach on this particular Sunday, 
And then a week later, a white church comes in and invites me to preach on that same Sunday. I said, I'm going to preach where the door was first open. So there is no racial preference in me whatsoever, and there never will be. And possibly, Martin, my ministry hasn't gone as far. It didn't go as far when I was in mainstream ministry. Maybe it didn't go as far as it could have if I had been preaching in more, you know, uh, white churches. Possibly, who knows? My overseer in the Church of God, Brother Huggins, who is my district overseer, he told me one time, he said, Brother, uh, when you, if you walk through the door of my church, you're preaching. He said, if you, so I don't care if I know you're coming or I don't know you're coming. He said, if you walk through the door of this church, you're preaching. And he had a church that was predominantly Haitian. And he was a Haitian man, and his congregation was predominantly Haitian. And uh, Brother Huggins told me one time, he said, I'm going to tell you something. You will be preaching camp meetings, Church of God camp meetings. Well, if you don't understand how that works, <laughs> uh, anyone who preaches camp meetings, you know, there's only so many camp meetings around the country, and uh, they choose the cream of the crop to preach camp meetings. So what he was doing was paying me a very, very high compliment. I don't know that he was right, <laughs> but it was a high compliment nonetheless, and he was saying he felt like that my ministry was such that it would one day be desired in camp meetings and conferences and what have you. And, uh, but I've always followed that leading of the Lord. Wherever the door opened, that's where I'd go. And there are people out there who, I'm going to take a minute to, to shove this pin in as well. There are people out there who don't understand. If, you know, I get so sick and tired of seeing things on Facebook and all about churches being all about money and preachers being all about money. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you judge all of the men and women in ministry by the few dozen major figures on television and all of this, you are very foolish, extremely foolish, extremely foolish, and I'm sick of it. I've been preaching in adult services. I say that because I started as a children's evangelist doing Jiggle the Clown. I did jiggle from the time I was 12 till I was 16. When I was 16, I moved to Texas at the Lord's leading. When I moved to Texas, uh, the doors began to open for me to preach as a regular evangelist, you know, not doing jiggle, but just myself. And, uh, and believe me, the doors began to open. I was not pushing against the doors. The doors opened. I went to visit my aunt who recently passed away up in uh, Missouri, for instance. And uh, I've told you, I was always a big kid for my age, and people always, I was always kind of precocious, and people always thought I was older than I actually am, and that may have played part of the role. But here I was, 16 years old, I went up there to help my mother finish the last leg of her trip, coming down from Connecticut to Texas, and I was going to drive the last 12 hours for her uh, from Missouri. And uh, I'm visiting my aunt, we go to her Pentecostal church there in Missouri and the pastor said I like you there's something about you I like would you preach for us and I preached for them and then when my mother got there my aunt told her said boy I'll tell you what you CJ preached and my God did we have church and was my pastor ever happy we just had such a wonderful time in the Holy Ghost you know and I was 16 years old so I was not trying to get preaching engagement but literally it just seemed like the doors were constantly opening I'd go visit a church just to visit and next thing you know they were asking me to come and preach for them you know and so uh, at 16 the doors began to open well I'm gonna be 52 next month so for 35 years I've been preaching as an adult you know and uh, as usual, I lost track of what I was thinking because I went off on. But anyway, but yeah, the older you get, this starts to happen. But anyway, but 
Uh, Creatures being about money. That's what it was. That's there right. You there you go. And in 35 years, I'm going to tell you something. I could count on one hand, guaranteed God is my eternal witness. I can count on one hand the number of years that I got paid for doing the work of God. I started out in ministry starting churches for the church of God. My ministry, I felt, was to establish a church, get it established, and then move on. Part of my reasoning for that was I was struggling with certain issues. And I was scared to death. I was not acting upon it. I was not living in a closet. I hate the term in the closet. I really do. Because it implies you're doing something in secret that you wouldn't do in open. No, the only thing that was in the closet was my willingness to acknowledge what I knew to be true concerning myself. That was the only thing that was in the closet. But I was terrified at some point because I used to go through Great Depression. I was very lonely. You know, I could preach the gospel and do the work of God, and that made me very happy. But the Word of God teaches that celibacy is a gift. And as a gift, not everyone is capable of that. And, you know, uh, I guess I'll, I'll teach for a minute. You know, intimacy serves many purposes for many people. A lot of people assume that intimacy is all about the pleasure, you know, the sexual, physical pleasure. And it makes me laugh because uh, that is not always why people engage in intimacy. Many people derive, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but I'm saying it's a fact, that many people derive their sense of value and self-worth from the willingness of another human being to strip down, I'm going to say it this way, and be close to them. And when that type of experience occurs, they feel validated, they feel worth especially people who have been molested, people who have been uh, taken advantage of sexually, who have been made to feel like they were nothing more than a piece of meat and, you know, something for somebody's pleasure, and they had no choice in the matter. And these people oftentimes engage in intimacy as a way of validating themselves. And it doesn't have a thing in the world to do with the physical pleasure aspect. That, that's a secondary, if anything, okay? And I could go down a list. I, I've looked at it. I've studied it. I could go down a list, you know, of all the reasons that people engage in intimacy that go so far beyond uh, the, the physical pleasures aspect of it. Uh, but I won't because Sister Lisa's got a presentation to do. But... I was lonely, Lisa, as a pastor, as a young man. I did not have the gift of celibacy. I knew that at heart I was a very sexual person, and I was not acting upon it, but boy, my motors were running, you know. You can rev the engine even if the boat's still at the dock, you know. And, and I was stirring up some water, I'll tell you what, you know. And, but I was lonely, and, and I would get so depressed, Martin, because I was trying to do the right thing. I was trying to be what I thought I was supposed to be. I was trying to court young women. You know, I was trying to find a girl because I just knew if I got married, that would fix everything, you know. And, uh, but I'm going to tell you, in all the years that I've been ministering, I've preached in more churches that did not give me a love offering. I've preached in more churches, including affirming churches, that have stolen love offerings from me. They took one in my name and then only gave me part of what they had collected. See, you, you won't see that happen in this church. You know, when, when I get up here and talk to you all about integrity and I talk to you, you ask anybody who's preached in our church. You ask Sean Thomas. You ask Ray Bester. 
You ask Brother Sam. You ask anybody that's preaching our church. When we take an offering for them, they get the full and complete offering. I don't care if right today we are going through a, a period of time right now where we are in desperate need. I've put pleas on the internet. Do you know, thank God, three people, thank God, have actually responded. That's more than we've ever had respond, ever. Now the offerings have totaled, and I don't say this to disparage them by any means because we appreciate everything, but they total $40. That doesn't come within a hundred million miles of meeting the need that we have right now. I mean, we are literally thousands of dollars in need right now. And, but at least they respond. You know, at least these people care enough. And when they, when these folks send their ten dollars, their twenty dollars, I'm gonna tell you something. Every time somebody does that, it's like them giving me a kiss on the cheek and saying, "Brother, I love you." Keep going, keep working, we support you. The amount doesn't matter. The amount, in, not, uh, excuse me, let me rephrase that. The amount doesn't matter. The, the act of giving anything is a show of support. And believe me, folks, that encourages me an awful lot. It encourages me an awful lot. So even small amounts are a huge blessing because they're an encouragement. Years ago, I was living in East Texas. And a lady that I met pastored a small holiness church there in East Texas. Her husband had been the pastor for many, many years, and he passed away. And I'm just going to say it plain because you, you all know me. I don't have time to sit here and mince words. This lady needed the income from the church because her husband, you know, had been the pastor, and the church helped support them. And when he died... She didn't know what in the world she was going to do. So she was preaching and trying to keep the church going, but primarily for the sake of the income. Well, I happened to meet this lady, and she invited me to come out and preach for her one Sunday, and I did. And uh, all the folks responded real well. Everybody was happy. She asked me if I'd come back, and I did. She asked me if I could come back again, and I did. Not one time. Not one time did this woman give me so much as a $5 bill. Not one time. And Martin, I wound up preaching there basically as an interim pastor for months and months and months. And never one time griped, never one time said a word about whether or not they gave me anything. Okay? So don't give me this foolishness about preachers being all about money. You don't know what you're talking about. Brother, I, I've known pastors. The pastors of the churches I grew up in as a kid, my pastors made very nominal livings from the church. Very nominal. As a matter of fact, most of them were bivocational. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Babcock was the substitute teacher. Brother Barlow was the substitute teacher. You know, many of them had to be bivocational because the church, what the church gave them was ridiculous. You know, it could never support them and their family. But they were there because they were called and they were doing the work of God. And, you know, that is, believe me, how many pastors operate. The pastor I did my internship under, Brother uh, Carver, Marvelous man of God, wonderful man of God. He had a nice church. He had a good-sized church. I mean, he had, oh, somewhere between two and 300 people. And yet the man was making like $20,000 a year. I mean, ridiculous, you know, the amount of work and the amount of stuff this man, he was running 24-7. And yet, you know, he was making a very nominal living. If you go to some of these denominations, Church of God, Assemblies of God, uh, some of these, you will find that they have a scale that they pay their pastors on based on the size of their church and what have you. And do you know in the Church of God that the pay scale for a pastor capped at 500 members? 
there was a church of God in Atlanta, Georgia, which at one time was the largest Pentecostal church in North America. They literally had 40 or 50,000 members. And this church was built in one of the wealthiest communities in Atlanta, Georgia. If not the, well, I always, it's Mount something, but I always forget what, whether, what the Mount, whatever the other word is. But you should go. I visited there one time, and I, I just had to go see. And you would not believe what it looked like on Sunday. Literally, I'm not kidding. You wouldn't believe. Limousines were lined up to go under the little porch thingy to let people out, you know. Limousines were lined up. And then they're all parked over here, you know. They had rolls. They had Bentleys. They had Mercedes. They had, I mean, you wouldn't believe the cars. And the pastor of that church, who became the general overseer of the Church of God at a later date, was making the same exact salary as the pastor of a church with 501 members. So don't give me your foolishness about how churches are all about money. And I will tell you, and I'll say this and put myself in great jeopardy. Uh, and I say that meaning I'm going to make a lot of people mad. There is a lot of financial abuse in certain black church organizations. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say that plain. There was one denomination I used to love to fellowship, and now I don't know if I'd even want to walk into one of their I haven't visited one of their churches in years, because partly because I, over the decades, began to see such financial abuses that wasn't even funny. These preachers literally used their pulpit as a money-making machine. If you ever notice, you know, a lot of these churches, man, they have special services every time you turn your head. They're having some special service, you know. And what it amounts to is it's another opportunity to take another offering. That's what it amounts to, folks. It's like opening your business up for extra business hours, you know, so you can get up there and squeeze a few hundred dollars more out of your people. And uh, there are a lot of abuses in a lot of the black church. And unfortunately, people of color who see this, this is why the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, were able to make such inroads in the black community. Because they tell the first words off their lips are, Preachers are only in it for the money. You know, they're only, well, these poor people of color, that's what they were seeing. Mm -hmm. They didn't realize that this was more of an issue in the churches <laughs> they were attending than it was in other churches. They didn't realize that, you see. And so, unfortunately, they, they bought into that line. But I, I want to tell you, you know, uh, there are so many things I could do that would allow the money that comes into this church to help support me. There's a lot of things. Lisa, we could get a whole lot cheaper a space, mm -hmm. but I keep trying to do things that are going to help our church grow. I keep trying to do things that's going to help our church get somewhere. And so, you know, this space, we were in that little space next door. Yeah, I remember. Martin, we could sell off all the stuff we had for the outreach center and not have to mess with that junk, not have to deal with it, and just have a small space like the space next door that costs half what this one costs. And then the other half could actually maybe go toward a salary to help the pastor. But I want this ministry to grow. I want it to prosper. I want everything we do to be the best we can do it. Right down to, I want the set, if I may call it that, to look nice. So when people watch our videos, they, they're looking at something that, it, it, that has a nice appearance and a nice backdrop. Everything we do, I want to be first class. Well, I cannot do that and draw a salary from the church at the same time. Everything we take in, uh, for the most part, goes directly to the church. 
There are some things the church helps me when we have the resources. For instance, it might help me with gasoline in my car once in a while. Um, and if the church has the money available, for instance, when somebody sends a very large gift, there are times when I am able to, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Reimburse myself for thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars that I have put forth for the church over the years, uh, mostly in the form of credit. So I'm not reimbursing myself to make money. I'm reimbursing myself so I can pay my credit cards, which I used to get the church stuff. You know what I'm saying? All the fixtures in our learning center right now, in the goal center, all the fixtures, the bookshelves, all of that, I purchased on my personal credit. When we first went to open the, the outreach center back, you know, a couple of years ago next door, right. I went... We didn't have the money. The church didn't have the money to do everything. So I used my personal credit, my personal accounts, to go ahead and buy all those bookshelves and all that stuff. And it looks wonderful, doesn't it? You know, I want everything we do to be top notch. Now let me tell you, in the mainstream, if we did everything we're doing in a mainstream church, our church wouldn't be able to hold the people. Seriously. But we're not mainstream. We're affirming of LGBT people. And we are right on the razor's edge. We're too liberal for some and too conservative for others. And unfortunately, you know, it makes uh, the, the people that our church attracts a very, you know, small number. And then trying to find those people in the midst of everybody else, it's like searching for a needle in a haystack. And if there's anybody on this planet who is aware that my ministry is not for everybody. You know, when we give out our, our outreach DVDs, Martin, I do not expect that everybody who gets one of those DVDs is going to say, Oh my God, this man is just so phenomenal, I just have to go to his church. I, I don't think like that. I'm realistic. I know a lot of people are going to listen to it and say, no, he stomps and snorts too much. No, I don't like the way he hollers. You know, oh, I don't like this. I don't like that. And, and I know that's going to happen. The sad part is when I was in the mainstream and I was preaching the same message everybody else was preaching, guess what, Lisa? Everybody that got one of our tapes did show up at our church. Everybody who listened to one of our tapes did show up and become a member. We, we used to, when I was pastoring my first few churches, before I, quote, came out and started affirming ministry, um, I've said this many times before, but uh, people would visit our church, and, and very few that ever visited our church did not go on to become members. Very few. I would literally say maybe two out of ten. Maybe. We knew if we could just get them through the door, they'll stay. We knew that. We knew that. Because it kept happening over and over and over and over again. I had, sometimes I felt bad. Because one time uh, we had a black couple from a church that I had visited to ask the pastor if I could use his baptistry. And uh, turns out the Sunday I showed up, don't you know, the pastor was out of town at the general conference. And the ladies were conducting a special ladies' day service in the pastor's absence. And uh, at the end of the service, they invited me to come up and s say a few words. I did. The Holy Ghost anointed me. I kind of preached for about 15, 20 minutes. Next thing you know, we had a prayer line. And we're laying hands on people, had to cast demons out of one lady, had uh, all kind of people needed healings and all this. And long story short, when I called uh, Bishop Williams later in the week, because I needed to talk to him about using his baptistry, he said, so you're the pastor who showed up at my church Sunday. And I thought he was going to yell at me, and I, was, I did. I was 19 years old. I was very insecure. I thought he was going to yell at me. I said, well, yes, sir. He said, brother, my phone has been ringing off the hook. 
He said, we had people healed in that service. My God, he said, I've had people, and I'm getting goosebumps remembering it. He said, we had people healed of everything you can imagine. He said, I've had people calling me the last three days telling me I was healed Sunday. This white preacher showed up at our church, and I was healed. And uh, he said, anytime you need our baptistry, you have access to it. Well, long story short, one of the couples from his church wound up coming over and visiting our church one Sunday just to visit. Well, they decided to stay. And then I felt bad. Seriously, because I was not trying to proselyte, you know. But that was how my ministry used to be. And that is why things work in the way they work now is so stinking hard for me to deal with, folks. You know, you can't begin to understand how hard it is for me to do what I'm doing and to see things, you know, working the way they work when in my earlier ministry, everything was literally the exact opposite. When I went from Connecticut to Texas back in the mid-80s and I found a girl who was willing to marry me. Of course, she was simple-minded and that's the only thing I guess was willing to marry me. And uh, I knew I couldn't take her far away from home because she was very attached to her mother. So I felt, you know, I prayed about it and I found a community outside of Fort Worth that did not have a church of God. And I went to the overseer and I said, brother, I'd like to start a church of God over here. And uh, he said, okay, well, why don't you see what you can put together and blah, blah, blah. And in the meantime, because I did not know the Texas overseer, you know, he didn't know me, I didn't know him. Well, he did some homework, apparently. I didn't even know he was doing it. And when I went back to him and I said, we found us a little building. The little building we found, Lisa, was smaller than this sanctuary. Matt, it was probably, eh, it might have been two-thirds the size of this sanctuary. Had a little office at the back, two little tiny bathrooms, and a sanctuary with a platform. And it was a little cement block building. And I went to the overseer, I said, I found this little building, it's going to cost us, I think at the time it was something like 500 a month, which was a pretty good amount of money back in the mid-80s. It was. And uh, I said, it's going to cost us $500 a month, and blah, blah, blah. And the overseer said to me, all righty then, he said, well, I'll tell you what, the Church of God will give you, will commit to paying half the rent for the next six months. We had, Martin, we had not had a home Bible study. We had not had a single prayer meeting, nothing in that community. Not a thing. I was going in dry without having done anything. And I looked at him because I knew that, first of all, I hadn't asked for anything. Secondly, I'm like, since when does the Church of God put money up on a new church start when there's not a soul in the world committed to that work except the pastor, you know? And he said, I called Brother Chandler in Connecticut. In Framingham, Mass is where our, our district headquarters were for the Church of God at that time. He said, I called Brother Chandler in Framingham. And you know what Brother Chandler told me? And I said, no, sir. He said, Brother Chandler told me, if that fella tells you that he wants to start a church somewhere, he said, you give him whatever he wants. He <laughs> said, because let me tell you something. You won't believe what he did up here. He said, you just give him whatever he needs. Said, and, and let me tell you, he must have taken that very seriously because the denominations are not in the habit of putting money behind preachers when they don't have a soul in the world. The only person I had lined up to come to church was my, the girl I was going to marry, okay? So, you know. Uh, but anyway, I, I digress. But I, I'm trying to tell you, though, folks, ministry is not about money. It never has been about money for me. Uh, it'd be wonderful if, if once in... Before I hit 40 years of ministry, it'd be wonderful if I could actually be supported by the ministry I'm engaged in. That might be nice. But uh, as long as I have anything to say about it, I want to try to use all the resources we get to build the church. I want to see LGBT people. 
I don't want to see them sitting in church. I want to see them full of the Holy Ghost. I want to see them baptized in Jesus' name. I want to see them shouting in the aisles and dancing in the aisles. And I don't want to see them leaving the church to go out to a bar and go out to a club. I want to see them living for God. Because that's the message we preach. I want to see them truly living for the Lord. Doesn't mean, let me tell you, life doesn't have to be boring because you're living for the Lord. Life can be a wonderful when you live for the Lord, even as an LGBT person. I don't want special privileges. I don't want some unique and unusual lifestyle. I want to be able to live my, my life normally, as normal as anybody on this planet lives their life. That's all I want. And be who I am and be true to myself and be able to pursue happiness as an individual. Amen. All right. Uh, Sister Lisa's been doing her presentation. Um, I know. Well, I know how long she takes. So I mean, Martin's looking at his watch. I know generally she does it in under half an hour, so I, I make sure I give her more than that. But uh, don't worry. Don't, don't think I chewed up all her time. And I understand, you know, I'm not preaching right now. I'm just trying to have a conversation with people. Um, because there are so many misconceptions and misunderstandings. You know, people don't understand how all this works. And I want them to understand it because uh, I can't stand the idiocy that I see online because people are under all these misconceptions, you know. Anyway.